Hello, everybody. I'm Rob Wallace here in St. Paul, Minnesota. I'm an evolutionary epidemiologist with the People CDC, here with an update on the COVID-19 pandemic. This week, we'll cover the state of global COVID, the state of U.S. COVID, and the expectations presidential medical advisor Anthony Fauci has for visitors that he doesn't advise for the American people. We'll begin with the global COVID. In the graph in red, the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center reports another more significant increase to 4.5 million new COVID cases worldwide for the week ending June 26. The number of global weekly deaths there in white underwent the first increase since March, up to 10,300 deaths this past week. The number of vaccinations administered this week there in green declined to 47 million new shots administered worldwide. This New York Times map shows hot spots over the past week in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Australasia. They are in purple, Portugal, France, Germany, Austria, Taiwan, Australia, and New Zealand continue to be epicenters in average daily new cases, per 100,000 population. This week, Belize, Greece, and Iceland returned to hotspot status. The US, Brazil, Bolivia, Spain, England, Switzerland, Belgium, the Netherlands, Denmark, Turkey, and Iraq saw increases in caseloads. Argentina and Panama hosted declines from last week. Here's a seven-day average of daily confirmed cases per million people from the beginning of the outbreak on the left all the way to present day on the right. We can see the spikes in cases when Omicron emerged in late 2021. The present hotspots we noted in the previous map are trending in different directions. Taiwan and Portugal's outbreaks appear in decline, although Taiwan is also clocking in at 30% or more in test positivity there in the brown. France, Germany, Switzerland, and Greece appear to be hosting new spikes. Australia and New Zealand continue to cycle through their months-long epidemics. The U.S. and Spain appear in slow increases of similar caseloads, although Spain's positivity is clocking in over 30%, while the U.S. is reporting less than 20% infected. We see that many of these countries listed here are reporting no national level testing data. Here we have COVID deaths per million people for these same countries. We see here that deaths are slightly up in all these countries, save the bottom set from France on down. The virus also continues to evolve. This is a family tree for COVID samples over the past six months, although rooted from the beginning of the pandemic at the center of the diagram and branching outward as SARS-2 evolved. We see in dark blues and purples the early variants like alpha and beta. In the light blue are samples of the delta variant. We see over the past six months that Omicron subvariants. They're in yellow, BA1 and 2, in red, BA.2.12, and now we see in the light and dark orange, BA4 and 5 surging. Omicron continues to explore SARS-2 evolutionary space. Across the Omicron group, we find molecular changes from the root of the SARS-2 tree here, numbering as high as 55 amino acid changes and 15 deletions. What that means is that the virus continues to evolve along the way, experimenting with the human immune system to the tune of over 4 million new infections a week during what governments worldwide are treating as the end of the pandemic. We see that recent increases in global hospitalizations may be in part related to the subvariants that have newly evolved. BA4 and 5 appear responsible for sharp increases in hospitalizations across Europe and the US. However, the hospitalizations may also be related to a near global retraction in non-pharmaceutical intervention. And as we talked about last week, a developing mismatch between Omicron and COVID vaccines. That combo, evolving subvariants probing our defenses and a willful public health surrender does not bode well for us during this likely surge this coming winter. Turning to the US, this past week, COVID in the Northeast and the upper Midwest, as far west as Indiana, continued to decline in cases per 100,000 population. Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Illinois continue to support surges county by county. The West and Appalachia appear to host another widespread ratchet up in caseload. The four corner states continue to be hit hard, especially New Mexico and Colorado. Wyoming hosted a rapid decline in caseloads from last week's surge. Texas and the rest of the South is hosting pinpricks of sharp increases county by county. Single counties across the Plain states represent pinpricks of high infection. Florida continues to be slammed, especially Miami. Alaska's outbreak worsened this week, with two counties there with the greatest outbreaks in the country at over 500 infections per 100,000 population. Puerto Rico continues to host its months-long island-wide outbreak. There are other ways of tracking COVID. The levels of SARS-2 virus detected in the wastewater that comes through our sewage plants, as reported here June 12 to 26, shows little change from last week. Colorado has shown a decline in tested SARS-2, but the Pacific Northwest, the Bay Area, Southern California, Illinois, and parts of North Carolina 
are hosting high levels in red. Ohio and New York show cooling off in blues, although Western New York and sites just north of New York City are showing high levels. The empty circles represent plants that are only starting to take samples, but we see that much of the country still doesn't host sewage. These New York results are worrisome as we see the changes in SARS-2 detected in sewage plants across the country over the past 15 days are showing plants in New York City in red with increases in SARS-2 detected up over a thousand percent or more. Although Ohio is in decline overall, there appear surges here and there across the state, as well as in southern Michigan and around Chicago. Hospitalizations requiring an ICU bed were largely flat for most of the country this spring and into summer. We see declines in ICU beds used for COVID-19 in the Northeast, but we also see continued upticks of 1% and 2% or more ICU beds filled in the past week elsewhere, indicated here in dark green and in blue. How much more than 2% the CDC does not report. We see a sudden spike in ICU utilization in Alaska. We see a continued increase in the Pacific Northwest down through Nevada and Utah and into parts of the Four Corners. We see increases in Oklahoma, Texas in the South, particularly in Tennessee, Georgia, and Alabama. Many states, including here in Minnesota, are moving to only a weekly schedule of reporting COVID cases and hospitalization, further reducing our capacity to detect these kinds of new surges. This is ongoing, particularly at a time when, as the CDC's community transmission map as of June 29th shows, that there are recent surges in Omicron that has filled much of the country, say parts of the Northeast, which appears in slight retraction. 86% of U.S. counties presently are hosting high transmission. With much of the country that is still reporting in tests for COVID-19 clocking in at 20% or more positive. And like on the global stage, SARS-2 continues to evolve here in the U.S. We see here new variants first emerging and then dominating in cycles of every two months. The BA2 Omicron variant in pink was replaced by the BA12 subvariant in orange, which is now being replaced by subvariants BA4 and 5 in green, which together presently account for nearly 52% of new cases. That is why last week we warned that letting COVID-19 rip doesn't produce the herd immunity that protects us from newly evolved variants on a two-month schedule. Letting it rip does, however, permit SARS-2 to experiment in ways to get out from underneath our vaccine protection. Here we see Omicron in pink has evolved out from the antibodies produced by our present vaccines. Letting it rip also increases the likelihood that multiple hits of COVID-19 produces the long COVID of cognitive impairments, ulcers, pulmonary fibrosis, embolisms, diabetes, and chronic fatigue, among other symptoms. Certainly none of us wishes to undergo what one does disease ecologist described for a colleague, albeit anecdotally. Quote, just had my first long face-to-face -face conversation for a while with a colleague who had their third COVID infection back in April. Massive drop in cognitive ability, memory, word recall, attention span, focus, emotional intelligence. Early 50s, but reminded me of an infirmed 70 to 80 year old. The tweak goes on. It's one thing reading studies, it's another thing seeing someone's character leave their body. I may be reading too much into it, but it felt exactly like talking to someone with early onset dementia, end quote. Certainly Anthony Fauci doesn't wish to undergo such a decline. Anne Appeal interviewed Fauci for the Washington Post magazine under a headline that, quote, the pandemic is waning, end quote. Peel writes, I am also aware that it would be a moral crime to transmit the coronavirus to Fauci. So when I got COVID two weeks before our interview, I obsessively parsed the guidelines from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. As long as I waited 10 days after my first positive test, I could still meet Fauci in person, right? No, I was informed by Fauci via a member of his communications team. I would need to test negative three days in a row and wear a mask, even outdoors, end quote. So no five-day quarantine for Fauci circle, as upon employer pressure CDC now recommends for Americans. And Fauci treats the possibility of infection after 10 days as real, exactly the kinds of precautions the people CDC has recommended for the rest of the country. And that's COVID this week from the people CDC. You can learn more about the people CDC and read this week's COVID weather report at peoplecdc.org.